It's also good to have Bernie with us. Bernie's back today. Lisa picked him up at the nursing home, and he's here. And uh, it just doesn't quite seem right without Beulah next to him, but uh, he's here. And uh, he's choked up because he's so glad to be here, I think. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, take this opportunity, if I could, to introduce um, to you uh, interns that we are currently, we had some graduate and some new ones coming, so I'd like if we could, and I, I announced this last week, but I, I'm guessing they probably forgot. Uh, I'd like all the interns, if they could, to come up, and I want to introduce you. I know Adam is gone, and there's Grant. Come on up, Tom. Where are the rest of you? Grant and Grant. All right. Where are the girls? Huh? Oh, they went away for the weekend? What am I doing this for this week? Do it next week? No, you're up here. You know what? We'll embarrass them for not being here this week by making them come up separately. And what I'd like to do is just have you uh, give us your name and where you're from. And we'll start here with Grant and Grant. My name's Grant Butler, and I'm from here. <laughs> I'm Grant Yamans, uh, Kansas City. Hi. <laughs> oh, this is short. Uh, Dustin Gagline, Ball State, for the last four years. I was from Fort Wayne originally. Hi, I'm Bill. I'm actually from... Uh, little town called Souderton, Pennsylvania, which is about 40 miles northeast of Philadelphia. I'm Tom. I'm from Nebraska. And his parents are here. They are. I think you should make them. Those are my parents. You guys can, yeah. You should, you should Hi. <laughs> and where is everybody? Oh, they're camping. That's right. I gave them a coffee grinder so they could have coffee. All right. Thank you. For those of you who don't understand uh, the internship, we, um, we have classes four days a week in the morning, and those classes meet the educational requirements uh, for licensing with the Christian Missionary Alliance. And then uh, in the afternoons, many of them work in the coffee industry. Some of them work outside jobs. And so um, it does not cost, and we, I think, are providing housing for most everybody uh, except uh, Grant and Grant. So if your name is Grant, there's no housing for you. <laughs> and uh, it's really been, it's really neat to get a business ministry uh, training time together combined in one, in one uh, ministry program. So uh, just so you know a little bit about that, we want you to keep uh, praying for the interns. It's a really formidable time when people feel a sense of call. Maybe they know, like Grant, for instance, uh, Pierce tattooed Grant. Well, they both are tattooed, maybe Pierce. The long, dark hair Grant is uh, really called to, to be a pastor. And uh, some of them know exactly what they're called to, others do not. And it's a formidable time when they kind of walk that out uh, with the Lord. And so be in prayer for them as we spend our time together studying and, and uh, working together and living together and doing life together. So that's just something for you to know and pray about. Um, we are kicking back in with the, uh, with the Friday night cafes. There seems to be a lot of weddings in the summer, so it's like halftime. You never knew if we were having it or, or not, but we are having them now, Friday nights. And uh, we had the Potter's Wheel going this last week, and we had some music. Um, and I know in two weeks, uh, which is September 12th, uh, Phil and, and Dave are going to be playing, and uh, we're looking for people to play music. Uh, we're looking uh, for people who just want to come and hang out and get to know people, and uh, we're excited about just having a time together that's less structured. And so if you would like to be a part of that, come on Friday nights, and uh, we just sit around and drink coffee, hang out, listen to music, throw pottery, watch people paint, and other fun things. 
Uh, one more announcement. I have discovered that some of you during the teaching time are doodling, which is fun. As long as you can listen, that is, right? And uh, I saw somebody's had a collection of bulletins with doodles on them. And actually, I wish you would bring bigger paper and doodle, because I'm looking for some artwork for every chapter in the book that Monica Hoover and I wrote called Giving Back to Church. And so if you're doodling, uh, and even if you're not doodling on the right size paper, it would be so much fun, I think, to, uh, to collect those, if you would be willing to turn those in instead of throwing them away. And uh, let us put a bulletin board up uh, with doodles, because I find it fascinating. And I like to see what's going through your mind while I'm teaching. It's kind of fun. So if you are doodling, be intentional. We have a deadline coming up uh, with, with the publisher of the book. It's given us a deadline, and uh, it's coming up in like two or three weeks. So if you're doodling, bring serious-sized paper um, so that we can shrink it down. They can't blow it up, but they can shrink it down. And uh, they're going to let us. I want Mac community to be more a part of the book. And so I'm looking for artists to... Um, Give us submissions of your artwork in the past or something you'd like to do. And if you would like some indication on what the book is like, email me at guyfonts at mac.com and uh, I can send you a blurb of what each chapter is about if you'd like to draw something. And maybe you have something already done that you'd like to submit. So that's, uh, that's for free and I, that would be a great help. And I'm kind of just wanting to hear and see what's in your mind uh, while, while the teaching's going on. Okay, um, well, let's open our Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. We've been going through the book of Mark. Father, we want to ask you to be our teacher this morning. We know, we know that we're actually facing things in our life that are sent to bump us off course. We're reacting instead of turning to you. We know that you would like to correct us and that you'd like to intervene and that you would like to invade uh, the situations of our life. Instead of making us more embittered and distant, you want to draw us closer to you. And so I pray today as the word goes forth like seed that would take root and produce a crop in our lives. I pray, Father, that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit as we enter into our community time around your word. Speak. Speak by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are picking up um, when Jesus is taking his disciples aside and... Um, and let's pick up in verse 33. They came to Capernaum when he was in the house. He asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept silent because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be very last and the servant of all. And he took a little child, and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little ones, little children, in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he's not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who, does, who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Christ will certainly not lose his reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go to, into hell 
where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter the life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. Be at peace with one another. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Can you imagine the discussion along the road as they walked with Jesus? They get to the house. Jesus knows they've been discussing something. And he says, what have you been talking about? They said they, were, they didn't want to say because they had been talking about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And I can just imagine that they're trying to convey being up on the mountain where Jesus is transfigured and Moses and Elijah are there. And wow, you should have seen Jesus. He was glowing. And then suddenly we were enveloped in this cloud. And in this cloud, we heard the voice of none other than God himself audibly say to us, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And they're talking about this, and they're thinking, surely it's Peter, James, and John. They saw this, Elijah and Moses, and were enveloped under the very presence of God, heard God audibly speak. They were there when Jesus was transfigured before them, and now they're, um, they're discussing who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus now begins to take them aside by themselves, and he begins to teach them important truths about entering into the kingdom of God. And I think it's our desire, at least I hope it's our desire, to want to enter into the kingdom of God, not just be distant observers who are observing the church and writing commentaries about the kingdom and what's going on in the church with the kingdom and, and what's going on outside the church with the kingdom. And hopefully that there is this desire, there is this sense of people entering into the kingdom of God. And they're discussing, you see, what they're looking for is this, this installation of the king. It's like uh, after uh, the election, whoever is elected president of the United States, they have this inauguration and, and they get to, you know, do it in style and have say something in the way that they're doing it. And uh, they're thinking, well, you know, it's getting to be inauguration time, and this is where we get to shine. This is where we get our positions. Jesus has promised us 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, and this must be it. We're entering into the kingdom, and yet Jesus is telling them that the kingdom of God is going to have entrance through him dying and resurrecting, and that doesn't fit, you know, their coronation kind of mentality. This is when we get our throne. This is it. And so they can't hear Jesus because of the way that their minds are bent on thinking, what is the kingdom? How is it going to look? What is our part in it? And if you're talking about what's our part in it, who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to get the big throne? Who's going to be over the others? Who's going to have position in the kingdom of God? And Jesus is like taking them and he's setting them aside and he's wanting to change their thinking about the kingdom because God is about to do something, the greatest work in all of history. And they're going to miss it. They're not going to understand the essence of what's unfolding before them as Christ lives out this living sacrifice, dying for the sins of mankind. They're going to miss the greatest move in the history of the world right before their nose because they're thinking wrong. And Jesus is pulling them aside and he's saying, look, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, but after three days I'm going to be raised from the dead. And they think, surely not. What could this mean? This can't mean literal death because... You're about to be inaugurated as king. We're about to go into Jerusalem, and as we enter Jerusalem, this is the time. And some say that Judas was even going to betray uh, Jesus by forcing his hand to set up his throne. And, you know, he's working of the devil. Remember what he uh, tells Peter after Peter 
takes Jesus aside and begins to straighten Jesus out like we do in our prayers oftentimes. Now, Jesus, you know. If you knew this, oh, didn't you know that this is, and this needs to be done here? And they, Peter starts taking Jesus aside and saying, Lord, may it never be. This can't be the case. You must not die. You must be the king. And Jesus tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're only looking out for your own interests, not the interests of God's love for the entire world. I must die for the sins of the world. And so Judas is kind of like being carried by his ambition, they say. And he wants him to be king, and he's trying to force the hand. And so the disciples are in this boat. They're in the wrong thinking about what God is about to do. And Jesus begins to teach them that the kingdom is upside down compared to the values of the world. And it's really hard for us to enter into the kingdom as American earthlings because our value system of success, our value system of... of um, doing life is not always lined up and it does not run parallel with what God's kingdom is like. And it wasn't working with the disciples parallel. It wasn't happening like that. And you and I fight against the very things that we've been taught in our educational system, in our family upbringing oftentimes, about the kingdom being upside down. I often get in trouble, and it's really not my fault, but I somehow become the brunt of parents' blame because they send their child to Ball State or Taylor, and they're learning to be perhaps an architecture, a city planner, or something, and they go on a mission trip to Africa, and they come back, or China, and they say, you know, I want to change my major. I'm going to be a missionary, and uh, we thought you were going towards medicine, or we thought you were going towards... Uh, teaching, and now you want to tell me that you have got to raise money to, from our friends and family to go to this place, and we'll never see our grandkids again? And now I'm even beginning to understand a little bit more of that parent mentality when I have grandsons now, but here is this whole concept of people getting mad because, you know, some student goes on a mission trip, comes back, wants to change their major, and this isn't what we have been grooming you for. This isn't what we want for your life. And, and the, the person has been touched by God, and they're not pursuing the dollar. They're not pursuing the American dream. Suddenly, they're caring more for other people, and their, their world is being turned upside down. And it's hard for us as parents to understand what that's like. And Jesus begins to teach them how upside down the kingdom of God is. And the thing that he first does, he calls a child. And a child really is like, get the children away. We're seriously doing business here. And Jesus says, no, let them come to me and don't forbid them. As a matter of fact, if you're trying to forbid the children to come to me, you're better off with a millstone around your neck and jump in the sea and uh, may you drown. Wow, that's a different kingdom value. I don't know if I really like this kingdom of God stuff, do you? Better to pluck out your eye, better to cut off your hand. At the end of service today, instead of having people pray, we have people with saws and gouges. <laughs> and we're going to ask you to come forward, and we're going to cut off hands if you've, your hand's been offending you. And so we welcome you to the kingdom of God. Do you want to enter in the kingdom? You know, it's like, wait a minute, where have we, where's the back door? But it's kind of shocking language. I find this shocking. I, I hope you do, too. Um, but there is this upside-down part of the kingdom of God that Jesus begins to teach. He, he, who's going to be the greatest, you know? And Jesus said it's a child who's totally dependent upon um, their overseer. And I'm your overseer, and the one of you who is the most dependent, and, you know, and we raise our children to be more self-dependent, to kind of cut the apron strings. And if you don't, your children are going to be uh, you know, unhealthy, and you're going to, you know, um, be an enabling parent. And you, you're, the law will teach your children if you don't, but, you know, they're in for a hard time. And so, but now he's teaching them something totally upside down from what we teach about becoming independent and responsible. He's saying, I want you to be more dependent on me, like this child. 
You can't, apart from me, you can do nothing. But with me, all things are possible. If you become dependent, if you place yourself in a position where you're dependent on God, that's where the kingdom of God has entrance for you. That's where you can enter into the kingdom. And then we see the scope of the kingdom because now they're kind of in the club. You know, hey, it's us in our 12 thrones. We're going to have this great inauguration and we get our thrones and we will be kicking some Roman butt and we will be in charge finally. And they're thinking like this. And Jesus says, what's the scope of the kingdom? Well, John says, teacher, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him not to stop. Don't do that because you're not one of us. How dare you to cast out a demon? You're not one of us. What's the kingdom like? Well, the kingdom is bigger than us. It's bigger than you. And by the way, you couldn't cast a demon out just moments ago, and now you're down on the person. Isn't that weird? We're always down and jealous of the person that, that is doing what we can't do and want to do. What's it like to enter the kingdom? And you see, I'm preaching hard at myself today. I want to hold the biggest cards, you know. I want... God to use Muncie Alliance more than any other church. Why am I like that? It's wrong. It's sin. I'm exclusive. It's a battle. Why do I want this? Because I know I'm going to answer for Muncie Alliance, and I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. But on the other hand, I also want that person that's doing it well to hear, well done, and I want to be able to cheer them on as well. And I want to be bigger than what I am, and I'm not big inside I'm self-centered. Are you like me? You are, aren't you? You want to enter the kingdom? You want to find what it's like to find entrance into God's rule and reign in your life? He tells the disciples, don't do it. If they're not against us, they're for us. Praise the Lord, they're casting out demons. Don't stop them. Don't stop them. The scope of this is really neat because we find, this, um, we find this phrase in verse number 30, 37. Whoever welcomes one of these little ones, in my name. I want you to look at that phrase, in my name. And then skip down uh, to verse number 39. Don't stop him. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. So we have this concept of the kingdom of God being ushered in, and there's a name that has power that we work under, and it's King Jesus. And his kingdom and his rule in our life is released in the name of Jesus. We pray to the, God, the Father in Jesus' name. You and I are accepted in the Beloved, in Jesus' name. Entrance into the kingdom of God is no other way except through the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. There are many ways, they say, going up to the same mountain, and they're all good paths. God says, no. If you want to enter into my kingdom, it's through the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no one can come to the Father except through me, my name. And on that day, you know, it says in Philippians that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. The name of Jesus is Lord. And every knee will bow and everyone will confess it. The name of Jesus. If we welcome children in the name of Jesus. If we work our works in the name of Jesus. If we are stirred by God to work for him, we do so in the name of Jesus. Jesus is the risen one. He's the exalted one. And there is no higher name than the name of Jesus. So... It is the scope, the name of Jesus. Welcome the little children. And I, I find it in the church. And really, the heart of what 
has been stirred in me in what God has birthed here by seeing a, a vision of who Christ really is and what God wants in verses my thoughts of who the pastor was and who the church was has been transformed. And really, the essence of everything I've tried to encompass in this book, Giving Back the Church, is more about giving the kingdom to uh, little ones who are dependent. And there are so many of us in the church today, we are like the disciples trying to stop people who are being stirred by the Holy Spirit to do works for God. They're, they're so in love with God, they're so called by God that they must do something and they want to serve God and it's the most natural thing that you can do. I found it interesting. I came in today early, I had a meeting and, and uh, I found, uh, you know, Chris Deferio, and he was, his car was running outside and he was making some lattes because he's in love with Lindsay and he's going to take her a special latte. And the things that people do because they're in love and the motivation behind the service of God, being stirred by God, is love. And yet we find people that God brings into the church and they're being stirred by God, they're being raised up by God, but we keep pushing people down and saying, now have you been to seminary, have you been to school, are you a licensed, because hey, you're not licensed, you can't cast out the demon. I was for a short time. Uh, in serving as an interim pastor in a denomination which I won't mention, but the initials are UM. And they said, you cannot serve communion and you cannot baptize because you're not one of us. You're not ordained and licensed with us, so you cannot serve communion and you cannot baptize. Well, what do you think I did? <laughs> you see, we have a higher calling. The church wants to st stifle people who are stirred by God. And giving the church back means that you give it back to Jesus. He raises, he stirs up people, and he launches people. And we, as, as people who are sort of the paid pastors, want to encourage that. Encourage that. It's giving back the church. It's giving the church back to the little ones. And what I think Jesus is saying here, and I'm going to say this really, it's going to hurt but I'm really preaching more to us clergy, quote, is that we would be better to have a millstone tied around our neck than to stop people that God is stirring and raising up to work for him. I would be better to have a millstone around my neck than to stop the work of God in your life. You see, let not many people become teachers and leaders because they incur stricter judgment. I don't think he was kidding. And sometimes I think about it, I think, you know, I'd be better off not being a pastor. And he, and he says, yeah, but if you don't follow me in your calling, you're liable for that too. It's like, I'm caught. I'm caught. What do I do? I'd rather see people raised up and smashing into the wall and learning than, and I, for the most part, help me, Jesus, than to stop someone that God is raising up and stirring. And you see, Peter, or, we have here one of the disciples. Who was it? It was um, John said, you know, we saw people doing your work and we said, don't do that. You're not one of us. And Jesus said, you'd be better off with a millstone around your neck than to offend one of these little ones. You've just blown it, guys. Isn't it interesting how much we can blow it and how much God still has invested and how much he still is for us? I'm amazed. Are you amazed? How much you can blow it and how committed God still is to you. His blood is there to forgive you. His spirit is there to pick you up and to say, now don't do that again. And I am amazed at the grace of God. God using us in spite of ourselves. We don't deserve it, but he still does it. These people had the, had the backing of Jesus. If you welcome one of these little ones, you're not even welcoming me. You're welcoming God, the Father himself. 
the backing of heaven is with you when you, when you move in the name of Jesus. The stirring of Jesus is there among his people. It's fun watching people want to sing love songs to Jesus. It's the most awkward thing. As a matter of fact, in the early days of the um, Seeker Church, which I, I have no problem with, it's just not who I am, but there was this thought of, you know, it's awkward singing. Even sometimes for some people to sing in public is awkward, so let's not have uh, singing from the congregation. Let's have special music from up front. And, you know, so the spotlight comes on and beautiful people are up there singing and smiling and let's hear the best of the best and let's not have other people sing because socially that's uncomfortable unless you sing good. And if you sing good, sing out. And if you can't, kind of just mumble under your breath. Uh, that's sometimes what I do. And sometimes I offend the person in front of me when I do sing out. Are you like me? And... Uh, I don't know how I got to where I just got, but there I am. <laughs> there he goes. Just the stirring of God when we're singing love songs to him. It is kind of awkward, isn't it? Jesus, we love you. I know you're mine. To you, all the foolishness of my sin. You're talking about your sin publicly and you're singing about it. How uncomfortable can that be? but how engaging it is and how stirred I watch as God, as you go to God and you see, sing lung songs. It's like, it's like the episode, you know, in Seinfeld where he says, I did something stupid. I told her I loved her and she, and she didn't say I love you back. <laughs> what does this mean? And of course, there's a whole episode on what that means. It's a show about nothing. Have you seen that? It's reruns now, but I know I'm old. i got to get some new ones. But, you know, I don't want to say Sex in the City or anything like that, so I, or any, you know, new movie. So I just use an old one that's sa somewhat safe. Maybe not, but now I'm in trouble. <laughs> it's Jesus. You're saying to the Lord, I love you. To you, all the foolishness of my sin, I'm resigning to you. And have you ever said to God you love him publicly? It's hard for God to hear you say from your heart that you love him because you know what? He wants to tell you he loves you. And he wants to sing over you. And he wants to, he wants to reflect back his commitment and his love to you. And I think that that's why... Worship time is so important when, we, when we're doing praise and worship is we're entering into the God's presence before his throne. And it's such a, a happening thing in the book of Revelations. It's like the heart of God is somehow being touched by us on earth worshiping. And he can't, he can't hear you say and pour out your heart without him wanting to draw near to you and touch you. And he stirs you. And so be careful how we deal with people who are stirred. Now we have this acceptance in the kingdom and he, he goes on and he says, um, you guys, if anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble um, who believe in me to sin or stumble, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea and have a large millstone around uh, his neck. I know the feelings of the words of Jesus. Judy and I were back in Illinois um, some weeks ago, only to find out someone whom we really loved and trusted uh, was a sexual predator. Just found out several weeks ago, he had uh, sexually molested um, a boy in the church. And... This boy now feels that he's discovered that he's homosexual. And I think of how defining that one sin is in the identity of another person. And I think that 
looking back with church about half the size of Muncie Alliance and seeing, not a, let alone the other sites, I think, you know, among us today are people um, who are molesting children. And if, if I pray that God would give you a heart to repent and that there would be hope. But you would be better to have a millstone around your neck, you know, and be thrown. And I understand that, but I, I understand my own sin, and I, I think I must somehow be merciful, but I at the still must, must have systems in place to protect these little ones. And so Jesus is saying that he cares so much for these little ones. And their angels always behold the face of the Lord. And he says that some sin is so deeply affecting people that we must deal with it ruthlessly ruthlessly. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And I wish Jesus would not have said that because I have actually heard of people that actually try to do the very thing. And uh, if that were the case, we would be walking around with no eyes and no hands, right? All of us? And so I'm telling you not to do that. But I'm, what I think Jesus is saying, I think he's saying, look, you need to deal ruthlessly with your own issues. You need to invite God to change you. You need to become dependent on him like a little child to change you from the inside out. You need something than beyond yourself. You need a move in the work of the Holy Spirit who is much bigger than you. And we must believe and we must point people to the work of the Spirit of God and the power of Christ in his name to transform the lives, our own lives, and the lives of others around us because there is hope in no other name. And this is not a religious game that we're playing, join the church. This is go to Jesus, ask him to fill you, ask him to invade that hard part of our hearts. Deal ruthlessly with the sin that, that entangles you and keeps you uh, down because God made you and has a destiny for you and has prepared you for something that is significant in his kingdom and he's brought entrance into the kingdom and you have something to contribute and the sin that wants to entangle you will work against that plan of God for your life and you must deal ruthlessly with the sin that keeps you down. Deal ruthlessly with the sin in your life. Now he, he goes on and he says, he says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and go into hell. Now this is probably one of the longest discourse Jesus ever does on hell. And... Uh, I wish hell were not there, but I want to be fair to you and say the Word of God teaches this, and we will teach the Word of God. There is a consequence for the rejection of the kingdom of God, and uh, it is hell. And Jesus said, well, let's just talk about the words of Jesus. Okay, how about hell, <laughs> where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched? How about the words of Jesus? He says, um, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. You have this promise from God that we all will be 
salted with fire. Now, what does that mean? We're going to be salted uh, with fire. I'd like to have us all go to this, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, because in this passage of Scripture, I think I'm going to give you the most logical answer that the Scripture has to offer, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want us to understand the difference between being salted with fire and being judged by fire. Because there's a huge difference. And Jesus is teaching on one part, he's teaching about Gehenna hell. And on the other side, he's teaching salted with fire. And there's a vast difference. And I want you to understand these differences. It will help you live your life today and tomorrow in a more realistic fashion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, beginning here with verses 12 and 13 uh, through 15. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw, his work will be shown by what it is. Because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved but only as one escaping through the flames. Everything you do, your life as a believer, God is committed to you, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And the fire will test the work of each man and each woman here today. Why do you want to um, be nice to that person? Is it to get something back, or is it to show the love of Christ? And the motivation... I cannot judge your motivation. And that's why Jesus says, leave the judging to me on the motivation. I can judge your doctrine. I can judge what you say. I can judge certain things. But I cannot judge your motivation because I don't know what's in my heart. I cannot even sometimes judge my own motivations. Why am I doing this? Am I being stirred by God? Is this a response and I want him in my dependence on him to use me and fill me? Or is this something I want to do to look good to impress someone? Is this something I want because I'm building a name and a reputation? Or is this something I'm responding to Jesus? Because my works are mixed up. Some of them are gold, silver, and precious stone, while others of my works are wood, hay, and stubble, and they will be burned up when the fire comes. It's almost like you read the book of Revelation, and Jesus reveals himself with, with eyes like fire that looks through everything I'm doing, and I will be... I will be, I will be um, seasoned with fire. I will be dusted with fire. All the works that I do will come before the examination of God uh, and fire will test my works. And I will survive and I will be saved, but, my, but what is remaining of wood, uh, of, of gold, silver, and precious stone will remain because it's God working through me and it's eternal. What I do in my own energy is guy fonts and it will perish like wood, hay, and stubble in fire. Are you with me? So it's kind of a good thing to have the Guy Fonts burned out, and it's kind of a good thing to have Jesus come through Guy Fonts and have something lasting. And Jesus says to the disciples, when you're being stirred by God, be careful, because the motivation and your dependence upon God, and you need to walk in dependence upon Jesus if you're going to have Precious stones and silver and gold, things that are going to last for eternal. Eternal rewards are yours when you're walking like a child in dependence. And he's talking to the disciples, and the disciples are saying, who's going to be the greatest? And he goes, you know what? You're going to be dusted with fire, and all of this stuff that you're talking about now, it's going to burn. I think that's what Jesus is saying. But you're better off than the person that's not entering the kingdom and is rejecting the kingdom because people who reject Jesus, people who reject the kingdom, people who reject the love of God will go into eternal torment. And so he makes this big, huge difference between the, the seasoned with fire and dusting with fire, salted with fire, is our sacrifice. And in Leviticus chapter 12, before they offered a sacrifice, they salted it before they burned it. Salt is a preserver. Salt makes people thirsty. 
And I realize that in my own desire and in my own stirring, there are some parts of me that want to build a name for myself rather than to let Jesus do something eternal through me. And half of what I'm doing, perhaps, I don't know the percentage. I can't give you that. I think I know myself only to find that I really don't. Are you like me? Am I, I have such mixed, I don't think I have 100% pure motivations on anything I ever do. If we're honest, go to your home groups tonight and talk about that. How much of what I'm really stirred to do is God and me responding to God, and how much of it is I ought to do this, or, you know, I must do this so I look good? And here are the disciples. Who's going to be the greatest? And he says, well, let me tell you, you're going to be salted with fire. And all your talk now and all your desire to have a throne that I promised you even, I want to give it to you, but by the time you end your life and you get to the end, you're going to taste me in a new way, and it's going to lead you to sacrifice that is so deep that everything you're going to do, being filled with the Spirit, is going to be a lasting work. But this talk that you're doing now, it's going to burn up. It's wood, it's hay, it's stubble. Jesus is pulling his disciples aside, and he's correcting them because they're thinking wrong. But there is this consequence There is this consequence for rejection of the kingdom of God. The valley of Ben-Hinnon was where they sacrificed their own children to Moloch, the god of Moloch. Now, can you imagine these precious little ones that are running around saying, you know, well, some of them I could one time or another say, throw them in the fire, but not really. Some of you may have some rebellious child and say, I'd like to throw him in the fire, but you don't really mean that. I know you don't, and I, you know that I don't, because that would make you really weird. Bad. Prison-worthy. But there is, this, there is this God of Moloch that people became so deceived, thinking that they could appease this God and make this God happy if they threw their children into the flames. And you can read about this in the Old Testament, how the children of Israel started looking at these other gods. And God says, I hate the work. I hate the god Moloch, and I hate how people worship him throwing their children into the fire. I hate it. And that became a place that the Jews redeemed as a garbage dump. And they would burn the garbage, and worms would come, I'm going to tell you a gross story about myself. My grandfather taught me to fish. And my, I'm a Fonce, and the Fonces, most of the Fonces were farmers. And my dad was not a farmer, but most of my uncles and my grandfather uh, on my dad's side were farmers. And so uh, my, my other grandfather, Holiday, who taught me how to fish, uh, we would go, he would want to build a worm bed, so we always had worms. And so, you know, you would take all of your cabbage and corn cobs and you'd throw them in and you'd, he started this worm bed. But to get the worm bed started, he said, let's go to your grandpa's house and there's a manure pile back and it's full of worms. And so I can remember, you know, even in the winter, you could dig your hand down into the manure and it was warm and it was steaming and you could pull out gobs of worms. And I know this is gross, but... I love fishing. And for some reason, we would sacrifice to get these worms. Uh, I don't know where I'm going with this. But if you take garbage, you've got worms. And if you're burning, it's always a stench. And Jesus is using this word, and it's the word for Gehenna hell, and it's, it's, the, it's the same word that is referred to in Revelation chapter 20. And uh, I'd like to read to you Revelation chapter 20. Can we just go there? I'm in um, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 12. And this is at the end, and the dead are judged. And I saw a great white throne, and him 
who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what, um, what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead um, that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire for just an eternal judgment. There is this great white throne, and anyone whose name is not written down in the Lamb's book of life, if you don't know Jesus, everything that will be judged will not be, will be judged on what you do with Jesus. And if your name is not found written in the book of life, there is an eternal destruction that I would want you to, to be spared of. I would want you not to have to have eternal destruction. It's almost like Jesus is comparing hell to the garbage dump where the fire is always burning and the worm never dies, as if to say, you know, this is where everything that is not wanted goes and where it's, 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 it's used up and it's only destined for perishing. And that's where this pile is. And it's almost like there's a pile of ruined people who won't accept the healing power and the purposes of God. And all of their life and all of the destiny that could have happened is now waste and there's no place for it to go. There was no place found for them to go. And so it's seen as wasted lives being thrown away. And it breaks the heart of God. It breaks the heart of God to see any, why, any life that he has destined for purpose to be so wasted in what could have been an eternal gold, silver, and precious stone is now at a loss, and it breaks God's heart. And so I say to you, as Jesus says to them in closing, everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, if it loses it, it, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Jesus is basically telling you that you're going to go through hard times, disciples, but the hard times will make you ready for the kingdom. It will be an entrance into experiencing something of God. You can either become embittered and worth the pile of rubbish where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out, or you can be pressed into Jesus and get to know him through the hardship and the pain in your life. You're going to be salted with fire. And if you are salty, you are useful. And if you are not, it's worth being thrown out onto the pile where the worm never dies and the garbage heap is there and the wasted lives are gathered. And he said it's good that you, if salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And I find that uh, my mom had a salt shaker, you see, and it was with her good silver, and so we didn't use it very much. I don't, I, I don't know if we even have silver. If we do, I, it's not used enough for me to know. But we don't have nice china, and when we do meals, um, it's an everyday thing. And we're very casual people. But my mom and her generation, it was very important to have china and silverware and, and things for the best people and the best meals and the best celebrations. And you pull out the best for company and for best times. And I can remember these salt shakers that she had, and we could never use them except for these things. And, and it, would, it had been there so long that we actually, she said, taste this. There's no more saltiness in the salt. And it was the first time I'd ever realized that the Bible is true. It, salt can lose its way. Did you know that? It really can. And it's almost like what Jesus is saying from this illustration to me is churches and people are much like that. When you become self-centered and you begin to hoard and you hold back from being poured out, you can lose your saltiness. When churches get so self-absorbed and so self-serving and stop looking beyond their own to reach out to the world that Jesus loved and died for, it loses its saltiness. 
And there are church after churches today that are near death or need to be closed because they're dead. They've lost their saltiness. They're done. There is no more life. And it's being worth thrown onto a pile because it's and being trampled under the foot, as the other gospel says, because it's lost its saltiness. And there's something about your life, when you try to make your life, you try to save your life, you actually lose it. When you hoard, you lose. So you need to blow, as Darren Campbell says at Exit 59, you need to blow the budget on grace. You need to blow the budget on giving of yourself, giving yourself away. Blow the budget. Be poured out always. Be refreshed with new salt. We have had other salt shakers that we just kept adding to and adding to, and we'd salt and back, it'd go up and down, and it would be mingled, and it would never lose its salt because it was always being poured out. And there's something about that, isn't there? When you're poured out, you save your life, and you're always salty. But if you set and you hoard, and you think of yourself, you die. And it's being worth thrown on the garbage pile where the flame's burning and the worm never dies. Wasted. Just like the children of Israel, when they said, there's no manna given to you on the Sabbath, so Friday night, collect double the amount, but if you collect more than that, it won't work because the worms will eat it. People trying to hoard life. People having a clutchy spirit. People not wanting to give away. And I've been in poor cultures that have more spirit of giving behind them than cultures that like us that are so materialistic we want to hoard is all you have to do is look at your checkbook and see what's important in your life and see am I hoarding or am I giving life you look at your time and you say am I giving or am I hoarding salt that loses its saltiness is worth nothing to be thrown out on the garbage pile where the fires never go out and the worm never dies but those of us who want to engage, and we want to be salty, and we're always pouring out. You'll be salted with fire. You'll have trials. You'll have hardship, but they'll purify you, and you'll have something lasting on that day. It will be gold, precious stone, and silver because you trusted in Jesus, and Jesus worked it through you, and you have something lasting. And the good news is, is we want to live our lives like that, don't we? We want to be a church that lives our life and our existence like that. We always want to be pouring out. Sometimes I get tired of it, but I always want to be pouring out. Somebody says, well, you can stop this, you know. You don't have to send anybody more out. And it's like, well, I can't. <laughs> I don't like when you leave, but I don't like if you're going to stagnate. I want you to go and do and let God do something through you that's lasting. I don't want to be a pastor that stops the stirring of people being stirred by the Holy Spirit. Better to have a millstone around my neck. Be careful. The most dangerous place to live is a professional Christian. The most dangerous place to live is to be a professional Christian. Watch out, pastors. Watch out, workers. Let's pray. Lord, you have spoken and we have heard your voice. Draw near to us, we pray. Draw near to us.